In keeping with our standard operating procedure, the next few moments are devoted to silent prayer, giving each of you the privacy of your priesthood to rebound if necessary. So with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, let us pray. Father, we thank you for the wonderful privilege and opportunity to study this portion of the Word. May God the Holy Spirit enlighten us so that we might grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Apparently some of you have committed some funny sins. (laughs) I say that for the tapers or whoever you call these people out there, not to insult them, but... uh, and they started laughing during rebounds, so I think, wow. They really caught on to grace. <laughs> but I won't ask you what you did. Okay. twenty seven twenty three of Matthew. And he asked, Why? This is Pontius Pilate asking this crowd why uh, concerning Jesus Christ because he just doesn't understand this vitriolic hatred for our Lord Jesus Christ. And he asked, Why? What wrong has he done? And when he asked that, they just shouted more insistently. And that is what mobs do when they want to get their way. They just shout more insistently. And they shouted, Crucify him! Crucify him! Crucify him! So our Lord will be given over to crucifixion. 27, 24, and this is all because of uh, uh, Pilate's expediency and his weakness. Although our Lord Jesus Christ knew about that in eternity past, that was not gas, it's a frozen, frozen uh, water. <laughs> Never mind. 2724. When Pilate saw that he could do nothing, but that instead an uproar was starting, uh, this uh, uh, Pilate became afraid, seeing this uproar of crucify him, crucify him. He took some water, washed his hands before the crowd, and said, I am innocent of this just man's blood, Observe it. So he went through a ritual of washing his hands, saying he's innocent of this man's blood, and yet he's the ruler. But he doesn't want anything to do with this, so this is his way of, uh, uh, this is the unbeliever's way of uh, rebound, I guess you could say. But uh, there, there is no rebound for the unbeliever, so it's useless. But this is how he washes guilt from his stream of consciousness. He doesn't want to feel guilty for the rest of his life. And the way he does it is uh, through a psychological method of washing his hands. And you'll note sometimes that some people who go a little off the deep end or who go OCD will constantly wash their hands over and over and over uh, to a point of obsession. Sometimes that's the result of guilt. And then, uh, oftentimes, if you've seen murder stories, the person who murders immediately takes a shower and, and scrubs uh, ferociously with soap uh, because they feel guilty about what they've done. And this is his way of doing it, and it's a way for that all unbelievers actually uh, who latch on to psychology. That's just the way um, they handle it, and obviously the way some Christians or many Christians handle it as well because they don't understand rebound. And they don't understand that when they commit a sin, they can simply name it to God the Father and it's forgiven. And a guilt complex is not allowed. And a a Christian might feel guilty for about five seconds. That's about all you're allowed. And then you rebound. And then uh, rebound guilt while you're at it because it's a sin. It's the emotional revolt of the soul. And move on, forgetting those things that are behind and pressing onward toward the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. That's what we are to do. But Pontius Pilate doesn't have any spiritual assets. He's an unbeliever. So he washes his hands, makes a big show of it, and does it before the people and says, I'm innocent of this just man's blood. So he's 
impartial as a judge, but he's not using his power as a judge. And he could have stopped all this, but he didn't. And instead, he just cleanses his guilty conscience because he knows what he's about to do. In reply, all the people said, and this is elliptical, and uh, the verb actually is not there, and it's elliptical because of the fact that the crowd so hated our Lord Jesus Christ, they said this, His blood on us and our children. His blood on us and our children. In other words, don't worry about it, Pontius. We'll take the blame. And obviously when they said on us and on our children, they did not understand the law of culpability. They didn't even understand the Old Testament rules of culpability. The children are not responsible for the father's sins. That's found in Ezekiel 8.2. Jeremiah 31, 29 through 30, and Deuteronomy 24, 16. The law of culpability states this. The children are not responsible for their parents' sins unless they repeat them. And of course, we have the fourth generation curse. I've told you what that means. It's the fact that their parents uh, continued in sin, and then they continued in sin, the children, and then the the grandchildren continued in sin, and then the great-grandchildren continued in sin, and it kept intensifying uh, over the years to a point of self-destructiveness until God has to wipe them out at the fourth generation. So you are not responsible for your parents' sins, yet they said, His blood on us, and on our children. And also, I guess you could almost call this a double entendre. It, has a, it could have a, a double meaning, in other words. His blood is on them and their children. He's going to die as a substitute for everyone, them and their children. Now, of course, we know, or we should know, that the blood of Christ is not literal. It is, it was a, it's figurative. It's when we're not saved by the blood of Christ, and you tell that to some churches, and they will about to go into seizure activity. But uh, Jesus Christ died spiritually as a substitute for us to give us spiritual life. Not physically. He did not die physically. The animal, they would slit his throat. And the animal would bleed to death, and that's because the life of the animal is in the blood. Our life is in the soul, of course, and it's not in the blood. And even some medical doctors have gotten a hold of this, and when they've heard preachers say that uh, uh, the blood of Jesus Christ, they went and investigated and said, human life is not even in blood. And they've, uh, and as a result, they did not believe the pastor. Well, the pastor was wrong. It's it's lit- it's not literal. It's figurative. And uh, I can't even believe there's a big argument over it. But uh, just up the road, a little piece at a place called Bob Jones University. If you were to walk on their campus and say, uh, "The blood of Christ is figurative. He died spiritually," uh, they would want to crucify you. And they would rip you to shreds, or try to, or try to trap you with their religion. And it's uh, it's stupid. It's just stupid to think, uh, that how does blood save anyway? And what, what in the world does blood have to do with anything? Well, it's, uh, it's figurative, and, it, and the blood of Christ it has to do with the fact that he died as a substitute for our sins, and uh, he completed the work on the cross before he died. So that means it was spiritual. It was not physical. And we'll see that coming up in, in a while, maybe not today, but the next day. In reply, all the people said, His blood on us and on our children. And in fact, He will die as a substitute for everyone, including them and their children. And some of those in the crowd will believe later on. And some of their children will believe later on. And so they don't even understand the law of uh, culpability. 27.26 
Then he released Barabbas for them. But after he had Jesus flogged, he handed him over to be crucified. This is in the subjunctive mood in the Greek, and that means that Jesus Christ's volition was involved. He allowed all this to happen. He could have said, uh, as the Son of God, he had enough angels, he could have said, stop this nonsense right now. And it would have stopped. But... Uh, because he was going to follow the plan of God the Father, he simply let it happen, and he was flogged. And um, that was just the Roman custom to flog the uh, person who's about to go to the cross. But they did it very severely to Jesus Christ, used the cat of nine tails and everything else, and ripped his flesh apart until it was mush. He became unrecognizable. He became a bloody, mushy thing uh, that, that nobody could recognize him. Not even the uh, disciples who had been with him could recognize him anymore. He was beat beyond recognition. Yet, uh, like a lamb uh, before the shears is dumb, he opened on his mouth. Never even screamed. And the cat of nine tails, you know, they have the little pieces of glass and all sorts of things to cut the skin when they whip you with it. And whoopsh! And then gushes out blood, and there's a big cut, cuts, and all sorts of things. And they did this over and beat him to a pulp. And uh, the Passion of the Christ portrays the physical part very well, except it's probably even worse than that. But it it portrays it very well. And just watching the physical abuse that our Lord went through is intense enough. That's an intense movie. I might knock it sometimes because well, it would be hard to show the spiritual pain, but they did a good job with the physical pain. But as for a Roman Catholic, he did a pretty good job with that movie. And it's in Aramaic, by the way. Use the original language that our Lord used, which is that's phenomenal in itself. So it did, uh, did, had to do a lot of research and all that in it. And uh, there's nothing really inaccurate about it. It's just... Uh, in fact, uh, some people probably even get saved watching that and believe in Christ because there's some verses that come up at the beginning. I don't remember if they come up at the end. But it deals with the fact that he died as a substitute on the cross and believe in him, etc. And there was no invite Christ anywhere and there was none of that. So it's a, it was pretty well done. And uh, that's because it stuck strictly to the Bible and what it had to say in the Aramaic. I forget which book he went to. Maybe it was Luke. I don't remember, but um, it's a, a pretty good depiction of what happened to him physically. And we all know all that was involved in that. The, the one wrong thing, though, is Hollywood always tries to dramatize stuff. And they had him screaming, and he wasn't screaming. He didn't, every time, what would have really made it even more impact was to see all this and to not even see him wince. To just uh, go through the pain of the beating and not even cry out. And that would have been uh, even, that would have had a greater impact, I think, but Hollywood always likes to dramatize and uh, they uh, they like the, uh, they like to hear the screaming and all that. Or maybe they just didn't even know the passage about the fact that he did not cry out while he was being beaten almost to death. So he released Barabbas and then he was flogged and of course, he let this all happen due to his volition. He's going to follow God the Father's plan. 27, 27. And then the procurator soldiers. Now the procurator just uh, said, I'm not responsible for this. If you're not responsible for this, then why are your soldiers taking Jesus? He is responsible. And uh, you, you, he does, and, wash, and washing your hands of it is a sad way to uh, throw away your responsibility as a leader. Then the procreator soldiers took Jesus into the Praetorian and gathered the whole band of soldiers around him. They stripped him and put a scarlet robe around him. The scarlet robe, of course, signifying royalty. And Jesus Christ was royalty. He was uh, descended from the line of David and Bathsheba, and he is true royalty, and he is the true king of Israel. And so they put a scarlet robe around him. 
And after weaving some thorns into a crown, they put it on his head. They put a reed in his right hand, and kneeling down before him, they mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. Now this is what the large uh, crowds they get into and they feed off each other. And they started uh, mocking our Lord Jesus Christ through a pantomime and everything else. And through uh, kneeling down and uh, acting like they're worshiping him as the king. And remember by this time he's a bloody pulp. Doesn't look like a king. But he's got on this robe and he's got on a thorny crown which hurts by the way. And the thorns stick into his head and he bleeds from his forehead as well. And so uh, they do all of this, kneel down before him, and mock him. And uh, yet he said not a word, and they just hail king of the Jews. And this is the foolishness of the unbeliever. They don't have a clue what they're doing, and Jesus Christ says so a little later. Forgive them, Father, for they know not what they do. And that was maximum function of impersonal love for all mankind. Now, you know when you stub your toe, you might say a few cuss words because it hurts. Well, our Lord's in a lot of pain, and uh, He's still thinking in terms of doctrine. He's in more pain and weak physical pain than we could ever imagine, and yet uh, doctrine carries Him. It's the only thing that will carry us, by the way, is doctrine through anything in life. Through any type of uh, painful situation, the only thing is the Word of God resident in your soul. And when the whole world's against you, as uh, sometimes it might seem they are, as you grow in grace and in knowledge, and uh, all the religious crowd comes after you, remember impersonal love. And that means that you can separate from them, and you can separate uh, both physically and mentally from those you aren't related to, and uh, mentally from those you are related to, and you can uh, use impersonal love and just simply uh, not let them get to you. And uh, this didn't get to the Lord, so why would you, why should we let anything get to us when we have the same spiritual life? And that's the whole point. He's testing and proving this spiritual life. We have the same assets with uh, two added, number one and number ten, number one rebound and number ten occupation with Christ. We have the ten problem-solving devices. He used all eight. And then on the cross, well, you see, we had personal love for God the Father and impersonal love for all mankind. During this physical part, he was using those two. But something unique happened on the cross that will never, ever happen to us. And what happened was, uh, actually, uh, God the Father, when he turned his back, as it were, on our Lord Jesus Christ, uh, well, Jesus Christ could still have personal love for God the Father, but at that point, he switched to plus H, sharing the happiness of God. He had to go to the ultimate to do that because that was uh, that is something that's nearly inconceivable uh, for us to understand. It's uh, almost impossible for us to understand. And it's nearly inconceivable. But you just remember that uh, God the Father and God the Son have been together in eternity past. In eternity, which means forever in the past. And uh, they loved each other with a perfect love. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit loved each other with a perfect love. And then God the Father, because he can have nothing to do with sin, had to turn his back on Jesus Christ when he was enduring the spiritual death. And so he screamed out, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani. He knew why he was being betrayed, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He knew he was not betrayed, but he knew why he was being forsaken. He shouted that for us to really understand the intensity of it. And at that point of screaming, uh, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, he had to have a little more than personal love for God the Father. God the Father just turned his back on him. He had to have plus H. And he was actually happy while he was saying, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani. But you see, happiness is a thinking. We have, we have the idea of happiness as happenings. Something good happens, we're happy. Something bad happens, we're sad. 
But happy, happiness is not in happenings, even though the English language even tries to portray happiness as in happenings. But it's not. And happiness is thinking. And he was on the cross and he was thinking doctrine and he had, as it says in Scripture, exhibited joy. It's unbelievable. It's remarkable. It's beyond, uh, nearly beyond human comprehension except we have the filling of God the Holy Spirit and uh, we can uh, understand uh, some of this. And it really, uh, this, uh, the spiritual death was the most painful the physical part, painful, of course. It's so painful. It could, and Jesus Christ was strong, but it was so painful it weakened him to the point he couldn't even carry his own cross, which was Roman custom, that the prisoner carry his own cross. But they dealt him such, such, such blows, he just had tried as hard as he could, and then fell over. And then, of course, Cyrene, named Simon, helps him out. And we'll see this. And after weaving some thorns into a crown, they put it on his head and they put a reed and they mocked him. And mobs mock, and mocking is disgusting to me. I don't like people who mock other people. It's just, it's gross to me. And when uh, other ladies make a pantomime at other ladies because they like to gossip, make fun of somebody else, maybe they're very flighty, or maybe the uh, a lady has a very flamboyant personality, like Katie Tapping, and just uh, very flamboyant, and then you see uh, some other woman make fun of her because she's jealous or something else, and there's, oh, you know, making fun of the same one by a pantomime. That's a part of mocking as well. It's disgusting. And it's what they were doing to Jesus Christ. It's uh, childish. You see children doing this all the time. And they should have their butt warmed as well when it happens. Childish. So they spat on him and repeatedly punched him. So on top of all of that mush, they're spitting into this mush and punching the mush. He's already in pain and they're still going at him. And that's how much religion uh, hates grace, and that's how much the stupid Roman, who is an unbeliever, uh, doesn't know any better, but loves violence. For some reason, uh, these Roman soldiers were uh, the type of people who just loved violence and got the kick out of hurting somebody. And uh, uh, believe it or not, most cultures in the world are that way. You go to the Middle East, they get a kick out of torturing people. They think it's wonderful. Old Saddam Hussein would uh, videotape it and watch it for his own pleasure. What pleasure is there in watching someone go through agony? And, and he would watch uh, people's tongues be cut out and just get a good kick out of it. Ha ha ha! What a sick man. They're going to hang him and he's going to go to hell. And he's a sick man. <laughs> But so is uh, so are the soldiers, sick people, just sick in the head. So when they had mocked him, they took off the robe and put his own clothes back on him. Then they led him away to crucify him. Now we move on to the crucifixion. 27:32. As they were going out, they found a man from Cyrene named Simon, whom they forced to carry his cross. Now this man apparently had come to see the Passover. He was a, apparently a converted Jew and he came from Africa, North Africa, a great distance to see uh, the, the Passover. But instead of seeing a Passover, he well actually he's going to see the real Passover, the crucifixion of our Lord Jesus Christ. And this is going to impress him so much he's going to believe in Christ. And actually he becomes a mature believer. And uh, and this comes up. And he, he's actually, his whole family becomes very famous in the church that gets started later on and in the book of Acts. He's actually, uh, this man actually goes to maturity and his family as well, his mother, etc., go to maturity as well. But right now he's an unbeliever and he's a converted Jew. Siren named Simon, whom they forced to carry his cross. And that's because Jesus at this point was too weak to carry it as a result of being continually beaten. 
can only take so much and it's in his humanity and he's not using his deity. Remember the doctrine of kenosis. Jesus Christ cannot use his deity at, at this point in order to save himself. If he did, it would mean that uh, it would totally destroy the spiritual life. Because we don't get to use deity, he doesn't get to use deity, and we have the same spiritual life. And he is using problem-solving devices and has passed them to us. So when you have a problem, maybe you just need to think about uh, Jesus Christ. Uh, th- these are some; these are real problems. Everything else is silly. So when they they put his clothes back on, twenty seven thirty two. As they were going out, they found a man Cyrene named Simon, and they forced to carry his cross. They came to a place called Golgotha, and Golgotha means the place of the skull. And 27.33, 27.34, and offered Jesus cheap wine mixed with gall to drink. Now, this it, he's not going to drink it, not, not because it's a sin to drink wine. He's not going to drink this because it's mixed with gall. This is a type of narcotic agent. It's something that the, the it's something that the Romans did. They had a, just enough mercy to deaden the pain a bit so that uh, they wouldn't feel it. And uh, it probably uh, deadened the pain quite a bit, not all of it. But he would. But after tasting it, and you see, he took a taste of it, knew what it was, knew that it was this narcotic agent, and so he would not drink it. The reason why is he wanted a clear mind to express his volition in using the ten problem-solving devices. If you're hopped up on drugs, you can't use the problem-solving devices. Now that doesn't mean if you get in a car wreck and uh, they need to give you a morphine because of the pain, you, you take it. You're not Jesus Christ. Don't, but don't go into some weird self-sacrifice. He's doing this on our behalf so that we don't have to do stuff like this. We don't have to go into self-sacrifice. And if, if we're in pain, we can take a, an Aleve or something if we have a headache or something else. Or, or take your medication. This isn't anything against medication. This is just our Lord saying, I need a clear mind to follow through with God's plan. And he's unique, and we're not going to have to do anything like this. So if you get ill and they want to give you morphine, don't refuse it. That would be stupid. Unless, well, uh, unless they have something that's non-addictive that can help, but sometimes you, you, it just uh, the pain's so bad they have to give you the addictive stuff, so they give you more pain, and it knocks it out, and it knocks the pain out for most people. And uh, except for uh, the last stages of cancer, I believe that gets so painful, not even more pain can. Uh, well, you'd have to kill them with the morphine to keep the pain away. And uh, there's debates about whether they should use heroin and that and all that to, for the cancer patients. I'm not getting into that. The heroin's illegal. so. Uh, but uh, they say the only thing I've heard, the only thing that, they, that can take the pain away from a, a cancer patient is heroin. The one that's dying. I don't know if that's true or not. I might have heard it from some liberal goofy guy. I don't know. So don't take me with the word for it, but uh, maybe it's just some junkie wanting to promote heroin. So, 2735. Uh, when they had crucified him at 9 o'clock in the morning, this is when they crucified him, at 9 o'clock in the morning. They distributed his clothes by throwing dice, and that fulfills the prophecy of David in Psalm 22:18. So the the Romans are just having a blast. They just got to uh, beat up a guy, and apparently that's a lot of fun. And now they're going to get to gamble over some very expensive clothing. Very expensive, it's worth a lot, and they're going to have fun gambling. And that's not a sin. It was, it's a sin to beat up Jesus Christ, of course. Not, it, it's not a sin to gamble. It's a sin to compulsively gamble and to, to br- deprive your family. If you compulsively gamble and deprive your family of, uh, of uh, its need for sustenance, then you are worse than an unbeliever. You're still going to heaven, but you're acting worse than an unbeliever. 
So I've realized there are people with gambling problems and they get addicted to it and there are addictive personalities get addicted to stuff but uh, being addicted to it's uh, one thing just enjoying a little leftover money is another. And all all of all gambling just they just use common sense. Just take what you uh, the extra money that you have if you don't have any don't go but if, <laughs> if you do have a little extra you can go and and uh, play at a slot machine and let it eat all that money and have all the fun in the world and you're not sinning. And don't feel guilty when you walk out with nothing in your pocket. Although you'll probably feel bad. But uh, <laughs> that's the way it works. And if you go gambling, uh, save yourself the pain and figure that you're going to lose it and then if you win, well, you'll have a big smile on your face. I did. And one time I had a frown. <laughs> but I did have a smile uh, several other times. So th all this means is they're just having a blast out of this thing, and they're sick people. That's all. <clears throat> so this is fulfilling a prophecy that's in Psalm 22:18. Then they sat down and watched him there. They just sat and watched him. Let's watch the show. Let's watch the uh, crucifixion. Above his head they put the charge against him. And they put this charge against him in three different languages. They put it in Latin. They put it in Aramaic. And they put it in the Greek. And it reads as follows. This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. And that's the charge. Well, uh, Pontius Pilate is weak, but he's brilliant. And he knew that that charge would irritate the religious crowd, and it did. They said, uh, what's, well, they thought that the charge should be blasphemy, but the Romans don't have any charge like that. They can put on Jesus Christ. It's their law. So they just went ahead and said, all right, the charge for this man is, this is Jesus, the king of the Jews. That's his charge. You've been charged with being yourself. And that's what they basically did. It'd be like the, the police knocking on your door. Are you Andy? Yes. Uh, you're going to jail now. And bye-bye. And then, and then what am I being charged with? Well, you're Andy Lewis. That's why you're being charged. No other reason. And so they said, this is Jesus, the King of the Jews. All of which is fact. M Matthew omits the, you know, uh, the word of Nazareth for a reason. Because that's erroneous. Jesus Christ isn't from Nazareth. He was born in Bethlehem. He wasn't born in Nazareth. Now, he did live in Nazareth, but uh, usually when people uh, uh, pass on, they say this person was born in Allentown, Pennsylvania, 1976, and he died in Anderson, South Carolina, uh, 2,222. It's <laughs> a joke. But... Uh, but um, that is just the, the, what am I talking about? Oh, he omits of Nazareth. He omits the birthplace. The birthplace is Bethlehem. He omits Nazareth because it's erroneous. Jesus was, of course, from Bethlehem. 27:38. Then two criminals were crucified with him, one on his right and one on his left. 27.39 Those who passed by kept on defaming him, making obscene gestures with their heads. I don't know what kind of gestures they had, but we have certain... We, we stick our tongue at somebody if we're disgusted, or we uh, shoot the finger at them if we're mad. And we have our own gestures, and they had their own gestures, and they were all crude gestures, and they were all mocking him. It was. It would be as if uh, you were standing in a room and everybody's giving you the bird and uh, saying nasty things about you and cussing you and cursing you and all of that. And they would say, You who can destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself. If you are the Son of God, come down from the cross. This was definitely satanically inspired. And Satan was in there. He was, he was in the midst of the crowd, not in the form of a person. But uh, he was the instigator. He, this is his viewpoint. He doesn't want our Lord to go to the cross. And he wants, 
and his whole uh, attack has been to keep him from the cross and his whole attack from the beginning is if you do this uh, etc and if you do that in the temptations that was to get him to from go, to keep him from going to the cross now that he's on the cross he's trying to get him to come down from the cross so the crowd is satanically motivated and so they continue to mock him and this is a temptation, but uh, our Lord is perfect and he's not going to use kenosis. He's not going to use his deity. That's the doctrine of kenosis. He is going to continue to use the unique spiritual life and he is not going to come down off the cross. Now we can understand how it would be tempting if we were up there and all these people just beat us to a pulp and uh, said all this thing, all these things about you, and you knew that in your deity... Uh, you could uh, turn green and grow 30 feet like the Hulk and just start pounding people. That's probably what uh, we would do in our old sin natures. Or is that what you think of me? What'd you say, boy? <laughs> and just hop off and just start wiping them out. That's what the old sin nature was, would do. But he is uh, following the Father's plan, and he has no old sin nature, and he's not going to whoop up on nobody. He's just going to hang there and let them uh, make this, uh, this satanic request over and over again. It's actually a satanic request. Get off the cross. Get off the cross. If you are the Son of God, get off the cross. In the same way, the chief priest, along with the experts in the law and elders, were mocking him, saying repeatedly, He saved others, but he cannot save himself. If you are the king of Israel, come down, come down, many your actions are, and we will believe. That's a lie. They haven't, they've seen miracle after miracle and still haven't believed. If he were to hop off the cross, they would say, Oh, diablos. That's Satan in Spanish. Hmm. They would say, oh, he's the devil. He just hopped off the cross. Just like they said when he did other miracles. Every miracle he would permit. Oh, he's not doing that in the name of God the Father. He's doing that under the power of Satan. And if he'd have hopped off the cross, they'd have said the same thing. They'd have been a bit shooken up and a bit scared that they would have said the same thing. They would not have believed. And this is all satanically inspired because if he hops off the cross, then what is there to believe in? He didn't die as a substitute for anyone if he hops off the cross. And that is what we must believe, that he died on the cross as a substitute for us. That's the means of our salvation. So what will they believe when he hops off? Well, they'll believe he's the king of the Jews. But that doesn't bring salvation. You have to believe that he's the son of God. He trusts in God and the Father. Let God the Father, if He wills, deliver him. Now, because He said, I am the Son of God. And that's what they're really infuriated about. Because He said He is the Son of God. And they completely rejected Him on that. And said, no you're not. And now they're making fun of Him and watching Him die and uh, enjoying it. These religious people, these pious people who go out and pray and make big parades when they go down the street and hand out money and make a, a big show of themselves and how compassionate they are. These religious people are enjoying watching an innocent man die. They're sick. Religion is sick. And uh, on the outside, it's a, like a whitewashed tomb. They'll be real sweet and kind and smile at you until uh, so that you'll go along with them. But as soon as you cross paths and you say, no, I'm not going along that way. That, that religious stuff is satanic and you're, you're filled with self-righteous arrogance. Once you cross their path in that manner, that's it. The fangs come out. Where's that brotherly love now, brother? Gone. And they just uh, sit around enjoying watching the Lord go through all this pain, getting a kick out of it. And it's really sick, but that's what religion is, sick. So, 27:44, the robbers who were crucified with him also spoke abusively to him. Now, this is Matthew, of course, and uh, he didn't get all the details of what happened with these two. 
and uh, apparently both of them started out speaking abusively and then one of them had a change of mind right there on the cross in watching Jesus Christ. We know that one of them believed in Jesus Christ and he's in paradise with him today. Matthew simply doesn't record it. And that's what we have, or at least uh, if he does record it, he's not recording it right here, 2744. And then we have 2745. Now from noon until 3 o'clock, darkness came all over the land. That means the entire earth became black. And it was a supernatural darkness, the same supernatural darkness that uh, that is going to occur at the second advent. And uh, they couldn't see. There was no light. And this uh, is the principle. This was uh, Jesus Christ dying on the cross as a substitute for us. And his hero ship is invisible. And that's why our hero ship is invisible if we execute the unique spiritual life. If we execute the unique spiritual life, it is invisible. And uh, it's not flashy. And uh, people, you can't walk down the street and people know that you've executed the spiritual life. We're not like uh, the Old Testament saints. David, well, everybody knew David, and uh, he was uh, visibly a hero because he grew in grace and in knowledge. And Moses was visible because, and there was just a few, and Elijah, visible. And there were, and Jeremiah was visible, although hated, he was visible. And this part of uh, taking on the sins of the world when uh, darkness fell, that's so no one could see it, first of all. And secondly, he did this in invisibility without uh, uh, no one seeing it happen. And he utilized to the maximum his spiritual skills and his problem-solving devices, and no one saw it. In the same way, when we live our spiritual life, uh, no one's really going to see it. I can't look at you and tell if you're spiritual or not. That has to do with the filling of God, the Holy Spirit. And uh, there's no way I can know that. Uh, I could know I can know uh, certain things by attitude or something. Uh, but right now, just if everybody's playing poker and they all look like they like the message, there's no way I can know you are not filled with the Spirit and you are. It's invisible. And it was invisible when this occurred. And then came this supernatural darkness all over the world. At about 3 o'clock, Jesus screamed with a loud voice. And this is linear action, Sark. Meaning he kept on screaming with a loud voice. Now, remember, it's pitch black. And the only thing they can hear is, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani. And he says this over and over and over again. This is when the cup is being poured out on him. This is when all of our sins are being poured out on him and judged. And it is a pain that we cannot understand. Take the pain of hell for billions of people and squeeze it into three hours and put it on the cross. And what's the pain? Then That's the judgment. And uh, we believe in Christ, and we don't uh, go to hell. But this is this was hell on earth for three hours for our Lord. Excruciate! I cannot describe for you the pain. That there, there is no way to describe it. There's no movie that can depict it. Unbelievable. Yet his spiritual life, the same one we have, sustained him. So we don't have problems. <laughs> Or we shouldn't. We sh- we have solutions, and uh, Jesus, we do have problems, of course, but uh, we have solutions to those problems. And Jesus Christ is uh, going through one of the worst problems ever that anyone ever one of the worst problem ever that anyone will ever face, and will do wonderfully with the spiritual life, and doesn't fall apart. You say, but he's screaming here. Well, it's painful. So what? And he's also screaming this so that we know the intensity of it all. And this means, my God, my God, why have you rejected me? It's referring to God the Father. 
He says, my God, my God, why have you rejected me? The reason? Because God, the Father, can have nothing to do with sin. And Jesus Christ has all the sins of the world being imputed to him. So God, the Father, turns his back on God, the Son. And that is exactly what occurs. And so he, for in order for us to understand what has occurred, he says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me or rejected me? And he said it over and over again. Now, God the Holy Spirit did not reject him because he was filled with God the Holy Spirit. And, of course, uh, that's been, you've, if you've heard the older tapes, uh, he says it's uh, my God refers to God the Father and my God refers to God the, uh, the Holy Spirit, and that's wrong. He corrected that in Ephesians uh, because Bobby uh, was studying the Greek language and called his dad and said, hey, the professor said that this is... Uh, uh, this is, it, it's not a plural. So how can it be two? You know, two people has plural. And then a light went off in his head and he says, that's right. He is saying God the Father over and over again. God the Holy Spirit did not forsake him. He was filled with God the Holy Spirit. And that was his staying power on the cross. The filling of the Spirit plus the utilization of doctrine. And that it was the staying power on the cross. It's the staying power that's been given to us. We can never fulfill it that far. And it's the staying power that's been given to us. And since this spills over into the divine institution of marriage, it's the staying power in marriage. We learned all that from uh, Ephesians chapter 5 and how even marriage is brought into the spiritual life by being a mystery, a mystery doctrine. And so, it's the staying power in marriage. It's the staying power in uh, during problems, during times in life that uh, you don't like to be going through, but you have the spiritual life to deal with it. And then in 2747, when some of those standing there heard it, they said, this one is calling for Elijah. Now, they thought that when he was screaming the the vocative Eloi, or what you see it as Eli, when you see him screaming this vocative over and over again, they thought that he was calling for Elijah. And they thought this might be the fulfillment of the prophet Malachi, and that uh, because Malachi foretold the coming of Elijah. But Elijah had already come, remember, John the Baptist, baptized her. Habit. John the baptizer. And he had already come as Elijah. He was Elijah who was to come. That's who Malachi was talking about. And of course, Elijah will come in the second advent as well. So they were confused on uh, this doctrine, but they thought, oh, maybe he's calling for Elijah. Everybody stand back and let's see if Elijah will save him. This uh, generation of people always looking for a sign, always looking for a miracle, yet they're all unbelievers. An adulterous and a degenerate generation seeks signs and wonders. I saw a church sign the other day, I won't tell you which one it is, but it says, Have you read the signs and wonders? No, the only thing I could think is you apostates! Don't you know what Jesus said about the signs and wonders? An adulterous generation seeks signs and wonders. So uh, obviously they're all into uh, revelation and uh, ready for the rapture to occur at any point, which it could or it could not. We just don't know. But they're into that and that is their fad. It's a fad. And Christianity is not for fads. You know what a fad is. Everybody wears the same clothes. That's the fad. Everybody gets a nose ring or a tongue ring. That's the fad. Well, Christianity is picked up on fads. And we have uh, the, uh, some church exploding. What is that church called? That's in, what's that one in Spartanburg our neighbors went to? The restoration. The restoration. There's things springing up everywhere because they focus on a fad and they're focusing on the signs of the times and uh, that's what tickles people's ears. And they have tickling ears and they don't want to hear the truth. They just want to hear something that entertains them or something that interests them. As long as it interests them, they'll, they'll listen. And so these churches grow and the, the people in it get very wealthy, etc., and they don't just grow, they explode. Well, that's apostasy. It's a, de- a degeneration of Christianity because we're all out seeking signs and wonders instead of 
seeking how to live the unique spiritual life. So with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, Father, we thank you for the wonderful privilege and opportunity to study this portion of the Word. May God the Holy Spirit enlighten us concerning the things that we've noted so that we can grow in grace and in knowledge and come to glorify you. In Christ's name we ask it. Amen.